I ran through that in a hurry for you all. But uh, we needed some time. Uh, I want to know, I want to hear from you. I love interaction. So uh, uh, we've got uh, just about 30 minutes of interaction. Anyway, now it goes to the floor. Yes, sir. There's pictures of the older trucks. Yes. What range did you travel with those? My daddy traveled from Nebraska to deep south Texas, 1,200 miles. Okay. And those guys, those old guys, would stack them as high as, as the sky. Clear the bridge. Yeah, yeah, yes, and I don't guess there must have been very many bridges back in those days because, man, those loads are tall. I've, I go back, well, we could look later, but you can count on there. Those are deep boxes, and I, I don't know if that's 12 or 13 deep boxes high on that load. Isn't that nuts? Didn't have the pallets. Though. No pallets, all by hand. 13. 13 deep high, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. So that's as deep as, you know, about 10 inches, nine and five eighths. So you're looking at 130 inches. That's 12 feet right there on the truck. Looks like about 13 by 10. There you go. Yes, sir. When you roll down to the south of the state, you say you're, you're, you're making up your nukes at that time. Is that also pollination service, or are you just going on to rented land uh, to produce the nukes? Okay. Uh, do you want me to repeat those questions for the, the video that he has? Okay, he's asked the question, uh, when I'm going to the south, is it just for... Uh, am I on land for pollination and I do my work that way or, or am, I, am I on farmers and do my nuke work and I'm working it? Is that kind of close yeah. what she's asking? So, uh, so I do it in two ways. One, I've got my own bee yards on farmers that, that I've gone, knocked on their door, get permission, got bees uh, at their location, uh, you know, on their farm somewhere. And, uh, and those I give, you know, when you get bee yards like that, I give those guys a case of honey a year just as a token of appreciation for them letting me put my bees on their property. And it's amazing. Farmers are so, so generous. I go on that property anytime, day or night, that I want to. Most of them. There's a few guys that are, are a little different. But most of them, in and out of their pastures, they give me, I don't have my wad of keys, but I've got keys that, that'll beat any janitor around of, of, to get in the gates where the cows are at, you see what I'm saying? And just let me come and go. Just, uh, you, you can get locations and, and folks are just fine people. Um, so, so typically when I'm doing my nuke work and requeening and all that, I'm on those locations. When I put bees on for poll pollination, I don't get do as much hive work there unless the hives are just getting so strong that they're gonna swarm on me. Then I'll go in and either take a package or a nuke out. Uh, like that. Does, is that? Yeah. Do you have written agreements with those landowners? Most of them's a handshake deal. Even even my pollination. Two times I've used uh, a uh, co written contract mm -hmm. with uh, with pollination. Most of it's just a handshake uh, deal. You can get burnt. I've been burnt. Uh, but even with a contract, it's it's not as contract's probably better. But but I'm more. I like that. Hand was up back here. Yes, sir. So. With these, let's call them uninformed farmers that you may just meet and say, hey, can I put some bees out there? Yes, sir. Have you had any issues with uh, insecticides? Or yes, sir. Spring cycle? Yes, sir. Most of the farmers are good to say, uh, what can I do to keep from injuring your bees? They're aware that, you know, we're... Thank you, I forgot to do that. <laughs> All right, repeat question. Uh, when I'm with the farmers, are the farmers uh, concerned as far as insecticide or am I concerned as far as insecticide spray uh, while I'm on the farmer's property? So my answer is, is uh, uh, most of the farmers are concerned to be helpful to the beekeeper, but they're running their farm. They're not going to hurt their, pro their income aspect just because my bees are over there. If they're going to do something harsh, most of my farmers will call me a day or two ahead of time and say, hey, you know, we've got a, a uh, you know, army worm problem. We're going to be spraying, you know, our cotton with malathion, something like that. Malathion's rough on bees. And so I've got to make the decision personally, am I going to go and move my bees away or do some, there's some other tricks you can do, uh, buy a lot of nets and just go out there and throw nets over all your beehives and, uh, uh, Bees that are already out foraging are going to come home, but they can't get in the hive, so they sit on top of the net. The bees that are in the hive are going to go out to try to forage and can't get caught, and so everybody's just stopped in the nets. 
and then then the next day or whatever you go shake the nits out and and everything goes back the the worst part of that is is just maybe on the really hot uh, georgia summertime uh, there's not enough water in a hive that you can get a little trouble there but but that's a pretty good effective way if you don't want to move the bees but typically i don't have much trouble and and if you're in an area like deep south georgia and you're on cotton there's cotton field here cotton field here cotton field there cotton field over yonder and it's not the same farmer so this farmer so however many you know there's four fields theoretically maybe 25 percent of your bees are going here 25 percent there you see what i'm saying and so if they spray that field uh hopefully it won't wipe out my you know all my field force another thing is if they're using tractors high boy tractors spraying in a field the rustling of those things going along in a field and the smell bees will leave that area and i won't have near as bad as aerial spray aerial spraying is rough on bees it's just plain rough on them um, in the last geez i guess 20 years they've gone to the uh the neonicotinoid or or imidacloprid uh insecticides that that they say is so rough it's been the greatest thing to me that's ever happened as a commercial beekeeper because I have very little. I sit bees down now as close as I am here to BJ uh, from cotton field, soybean field, and, and I just have almost no bee kill anymore, almost none. It's just when there's some weird insect that pops up and they've got to come in with something else. Uh, but those other, those other ones, uh, you know, I know that you can read and, and whole countries have banned those those pesticides but if if we got rid of the neonics in america the farmers are going to go back to the old seven oil seven dust you know uh, pyrethroids the the malathions and i lost a lot of bees in those years so uh so anyway that's a long answer for a little question got some good out of it yes sir typically what is uh what is the size of your bee yard how many colonies do you keep in the yard and uh with your mating nukes how many Mating nukes do you keep in like a mating yard? Okay, so he's asking uh, typically the number of hives I keep uh, in, a, in a bee yard and typically the, as far as a nuke uh, mating yard and making up nukes. I try to run somewhere 40, uh, maybe up to 50 hives, established hives per yard. Uh, sometimes I get, you know, one area I know is going to do better than another area and if I don't have time to get more locations, I'll double up. Uh, I don't like to, but, but I'll do that. As far as uh, the nuke mating, if I'm making one or two frame nukes and putting queen cells in, that's how I do most of my nuke make, making, uh, I'll put uh, one to 300 in, in one spot. If I've got a good spot, I want something that if the wind's blowing, you know, like back on, under pine trees or good, good area of live oak trees down in South Georgia, to where if the wind's blowing, and it's not so much down here. So if it's a good day and that virgin goes out to mate, she's got some protection from the wind and hopefully she'll get back uh, to my nuke. So uh, uh, of course then I'll have some kind of a drone yard somewhere close by uh, to supply drones for all of that. But uh, uh, yes, sir, that's, that's kind of uh, my numbers is what I try to run. Yes, ma'am. When you're trying to decide uh, or find a new farmer's field, what sort of things are you looking at to decide what door you're going to knock on to ask that farmer to put these That's a good question. Your question is, when I'm looking for a new bee yard, uh, what am I looking for as far as going to say, hey, I want to put bees on this farmer because I'm finding this foliage in that area or whatever. And uh, uh, so in North Georgia, to me, of course, I'm a honey producer at heart. I love producing honey. I love getting my bees try to get my bees to peak population right when the honey flow is, is you know, the plants are blooming and, and make the most honey possible. Now, you know, there's variables and all of that and, and maybe I've done it once in my lifetime, got it all just right. But anyway, it's, uh, it's uh, I just love that game, okay? And, and seeing those bees, boy, I love taking that lid off and just seeing all the new white wax and the foundation being drawn and whew, that's, that's just lovely to me. Anyway, uh, North Georgia, our main two honey plants up here is the, the little Dutch clover that you see in people's yards and, and privet hedge uh, around the, you know, the trashy stuff around 
fields or, or, or you know, parks or whatever, just out in the woods. So that's what I look for when I'm driving around. I'm looking, and the, the, the privet hedge is easy. You can do that any time of the year. The, the Dutch clover, you about got to do it when it's blooming in the spring and find, find where it's at. I like getting by, you know, I love it out in the farmer's fields to be away from, from, from population. Uh, but here in the metro Atlanta area, it's hard to get away from population. But population can give you a, an advantage. Uh, you get by some old subdivisions that the people have quit worrying about that it's just grass. And they don't care if they've got, you know, some, some of the clover growing in their yard. And so now what you've got, and the Dutch clover is so much better than like crimson clover. Crimson clover grows up and starts blooming. And if you cut it off, it don't bloom again that year. It's next year before it blooms again. But Dutch clover, you can cut it off, it comes right back and blooms. Cut it off, comes right back and blooms. So if you're near a, an old subdivision, or most of you is probably backyard beekeeping, whatever, uh, You've got all of these different yards within a mile of that. I think bees typically work about a mile to effectively work the hive. Some of the books say they go farther. I don't know. I know this. If I pick this bee yard up here and move it a mile away, I don't find any bees back at, at, at the original location. If I pick this yard of bees up and move a half a mile away, I'll find forage bees back over here. You see what I'm saying? So a mile gets them to relocate uh, is my experience. So, uh, uh, so if you've got your bees and within a mile there's, there's an old subdivision and you've got, you know, all these people mowing at different times, you've got, a, you've got different bloom all the time. And cutting Dutch clover off and it regrowing gives it, uh, uh, extends the bloom out. We're out in a pasture, it gets up, it blooms, it goes through its cycle and it's, it, it quits. So you'll gain a few more weeks of, of bloom maybe by having that. But getting in and around an urban area, uh, especially if you're trying to set up, like he was asking, 50 hives of bees in an urban spot, yeah, good luck with that. You know, it's, uh, uh, the, the crazy thing is, there's probably bees in the people's yards, plenty of them, and they don't see a honeybee out there, and now they see white beehives or whatever, orange beehives sitting over there, and now there's bees all in their yard, and they'll complain enough to the neighbor, you know, I lose bee yards. Uh, with that situation just because they want to keep peace with their neighbors. Next question. Yes, sir. Um, a little bit about licensing. Uh, are you primarily wholesale at like small volume or by the barrel? And what sort of license do you hold? He's asking about licensing, especially in the bottling uh, aspect. Uh, if, you're, if you're selling just bulk honey in 55-gallon drums, you don't need to have a bottling license or, or label that aspect. They will come and then you'll have to have a, a food processor's license for your warehouse and they'll come out once a year. And just, you know, there's, there's a, a uh, used to be the same as a restaurant or a food processing place. But a few years ago, the Department of Agriculture rewrote and we've got one for beekeepers now. So you need a washable floor, washable walls, hot and cold running water, you know, bathroom, stuff like that. I get away with with not so much of that, especially the bathroom aspect, because I don't hire anybody, it's just family, and, and my house is there, my son's house is over there, and so they allow us to, you know, to, to be off. And the Department of Ag, I find, if, if you try to work with them a little bit, they're very lenient in that aspect. So, so the, the, the bulk honey, just the license for your, your extracting facility. Once you step into bottling, now you're gonna have to get uh, uh, you know, your label has to carry certain things on. It has to have your name on it. Can't be your, you can have your business name, but it has to have your name on it. Uh, the weight in, in U.S. and metric, uh, uh, physical location on it. And you have to send that to the Department of Ag and they look it over and they'll tell you, you know, yes or no, or add this or take, you know. Of course, I don't guess they ever take, tell anybody to take something off. I mean, if you're making a medical claim or something like that on your label, that's, you can't do that. You know, this, this honey cures, you know, sneezing or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Or cough. You can't make a medical claim on, on, your, on your label. You might tell them that they won't inspect your, your home kitchen. That's true. They won't inspect your home kitchen. But on the other hand, if you're, if you're, if you're making honey or, or, or processing honey in your home kitchen and you're going out and you're the person selling it, at the craft fair or the 
farmer's market or out your front door. You don't have to, you can put whatever label you want on there, whatever you want to do. But the second that you go down to the local hardware store or health food store and they buy your honey in jars to put on the shelf, now you've, you've stepped into the other arena where, where you have to worry about your labeling and they don't want you extracting in your, in your kitchen. Yes, sir. Question about how you handle nuke sales. Okay, the question he's asking is how do I manage nuke sales as far as people coming to pick up no shows and and if they come later in the day you've got you know the the forage bees have come out. So uh, so what do I do? Well, first off, if you have the people pay a hundred percent before the day of pickup, you'll have almost everybody come. There will be a few that will pay you and never show. And then you, I guess you have 150 bucks. Uh, I don't feel obligated in any way to try to get their money back. You know, I've contacted them, let them know that this is the day for, for pickup. And, uh, and so if they don't show, then that's just, I just pocket the money. Uh, that's the way I look at it. I don't know, is that, is that the wrong area in the, in the honesty department? I feel comfortable with that, so. You're being honest with them. They're not just falling that's, to run the deal that you made. Exactly. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, they're the one that broke the yeah. verbal contract. So, so, uh, so that's how I work that. Uh, I use mostly the Jester nuke, and, and if, you, if you try to close that up, I, I sell all of my nukes completely closed in. The night before the sale day, I close them up, stack them up, bring them to my, or wherever I'm going to distribute them, at my house or, or you know, somewhere uh, else. Uh, so th they're all completely closed up. But you've got to, got to, got to have plenty of air movement or those things, if, if it gets a little hot that day, uh, I call it meltdown, but once a beehive starts getting hot, overheated, I, I guess it's the bees throwing up. They just get all sticky, and it just, it's, just, uh, it's just an absolute mess. And the only thing that will be left in there of any value, but you got to do it quick, is get the brood out and put it in a healthy hive. I now cut a, a four by six inch hole in the bottom of, of every one. If, if you get a jester nuke from me, uh, there's that hole is in the bottom and when and the screen wire has to be aluminum If you're gonna do this make sure it's aluminum. I the first year I did it It was was is that fiberglass or whatever kind of screen wire and and it works perfect Until you close that hive up and somehow bees know within minutes that that they can't get out and everybody in the hive knows and they start trying to find you'll hear them chewing and boy, they'll chew right through that, that other screen within, you know, the screen looks great till you close it. The first time I'm, I'm trying to sell like 100 or 150 at a farm store in Dallas, Georgia. And we're like, well, there's a few bees coming out over there. And then, well, there's some more over there. And then the next thing, you know, we just got bees hanging out and we start looking underneath. And, and so I switched to aluminum and everything's fine. So that's how I handle those things. So the other thing I do is I tell them, I say, you see the mailbox out there by my driveway? I said, yeah, when you get past that mailbox, it's over. You know, you bought a nuke and we're done. You know, I've looked in these. I know there's queens. I know there's brood. I know everything's, you know, it's the transaction is done. And uh, that doesn't help a lot, but you'll get your calls and no queen, can't find the queen. Yeah, I know the queen's dead. Did you really see the queen? You know, it's everything's about the queen. I, <laughs> thank you, the, you hardcore people for staying. <laughs> I've enjoyed uh, letting y'all listen to me.